Hi, it's Dr. Steve Weiner again from Santa Rosa Beach, Florida in the Panhandle. And today I'm going to discuss the differences in susceptibility of hyaluronic acid fillers to hyaluronidase. So basically hyaluronidase is not approved to dissolve HA fillers, but it is used for that. Its approved uses are to enhance the permeation of subcutaneous or intramuscular injections, including local anesthetics and subcutaneous infusions. And it's also used to promote resorption of excess contrast media and urinary art angiography, okay? In Europe, they also use it to promote absorption of blood or hematoma. Also, one of the big things that it's used for is to reduce the tissue damage when you have extravasation of IV fluid, particularly chemotherapeutics. The off-label uses are to degrade hyaluronic acid fillers in the event of occlusion, uh, poor cosmetic result or nodules, and sometimes infections. It's actually controversial whether you should use it in infections because it's theoretically possible to spread the infection when you use hyaluronidase. What's very interesting about hyaluronidase is that it's very similar across many species, including mammals, bacteria, and insects. But the way they act is slightly different because there are some differences. In the mammalian hyaluronidase, it cleaves it right here. In the leeches, it cleaves it right here. So that's the science for you. So what is the half-life of hyaluronidase? Well, if it's injected um, intravascularly, it's between two and five minutes. Somewhere around 2.1 minutes is what I've seen. And why is that? Because there's inhibitors that are circulating within the blood. There's also inhibitors uh, that you can ingest that include anti-inflammatory agents like dexamethasone, salicylates, indomethacin, and there's numerous plant-based compounds, including flavonoids and antioxidants, antihistamines. So there's several things that degrade it or inhibit it. Burn, sepsis, and shock increase the natural inhibitors. So dermal activity has been shown to be up to 48 hours, but I'm gonna show you another study that might contradict this. And why is that? The prolonged activity might be due because there's an immediate breaking of the cross-links of the hyaluronic acid filler, and then the natural hyaluronidase within the body continues to break down the non cross link HA for another 48 hours. But let me show you this study, which is kind of interesting. So this was done in Korea, and it was a rat study. And they injected HA, and then they injected hyaluronidase a week later. And then they re-injected HA at various time points, 30 minutes to 14 days. And then biopsies were taken at one week after that injection. And what they found was that the six hour reinjection period was very similar to the control where they didn't add hyaluronidase. So what that kind of says, it kind of goes contradictory to my last slide, is that after six hours, it seems to be okay to reinject hyaluronic acid filler if you dissolved it. That's not what I do in my practice. I usually wait at least two or three days, but this study suggests that you might be able to do it in six hours. So allergies to hyaluronidase, people are all afraid of this. Let me just go through the nitty gritty about that. So it's reported to be 0.05 to 0.69 if you deliver mammalian hyaluronidase. So that is mostly puritis, which is itching and erythema. Angioedema and eudicaria, itching and swelling, severe swelling occurs in less than 0.1%, less than one in a thousand people. If you do a dose that's over 100,000 units, which we don't do when we're trying to dissolve hyaluronic acid filler, it's a much higher incidence of allergies, so it's dose dependent. Most are immediate hypersensitivities, with, but there are some delayed hypersensitivities at 24 hours. The reason why people are worried about this allergy is because the previous mammalian-derived products contained a lot of impurities. They don't now. They used to. So the purification process is much better now. So what is this link to bee stings? So hyaluronidase is found in bee stings to allow for that toxin to penetrate better. It facilitates the movement of the cytotoxic or neurotoxic agents through the skin. And there's 30% crossover between the bee hyaluronidase and the human hyaluronidase. 
However, within the bee sting are these several compounds, okay? Phospholipase A2 is 12% of the bee venom, and it's the most allergic component of the bee venom. The second most allergic component is the hyaluronidase. There's also one other product called the mast cell degranulation peptide, and that's also important in um, allergies. So, you can be allergic to phospholipase A2 and still do absolutely fine with hyaluronidase. But in general, it's probably a good idea to do pre-testing in people that have bee stings unless there's a very severe uh, vascular occlusion or blindness when um, you, won't, you can take the risk of having an allergic reaction. So let's go over Hylonex. Hylonex is a human recombinant form of hyaluronidase. And are there allergic reactions to that? So they did a 100 placebo controlled patients. Some were injected with saline and some were injected with Hylonex. They found that there were no allergic reactions to Hylonex. So there is also no risk of having this spongiform encephalitis. So if you do do ovine or bovine um, extraction to get the hyaluronidase, there is a theoretical risk of the spongiform encephalitis. That's not a, the case when you use Hylonex. So it's a pure form of hyaluronidase and theoretically zero or very low risk of having allergic reactions. This is the form of hyaluronidase that I use. So now we're gonna go into the differences between different fillers in their susceptibility to hyaluronidase. So in this study by Rao, Chi, and Woodward, hi Julie again, uh, it was published in the JDD in 2014. And they used Vitrase and Hyalinex um, to, to dissolve the HA filler. They found that Hyalinex and Vitrase were equal in their ability to dissolve the filler. And what they found was that Bellatero was the hardest to dissolve, followed by Juvederm, Voluma was easier, and Restylane was the easiest to dissolve. The higher the concentration of the hyaluronidase, the better the results. There was more degradation at five minutes than immediate, but the five minute degradation levels were very similar to the 15 minute degradation levels. What they proposed was that the more cross-linking and the higher concentration of the HA filler, and if it was monophasic and more cohesive, it was more resistant. They also proposed that cross-linking made the hyaluronic acid filler more difficult to penetrate with the hyaluronidase and therefore more resistant to the hyaluronidase. So now we're going to go um, using bovine hyaluronidase and we're going to use it against Restylane products and Juvederm products. And everyone knows that the Restylane products are 20 milligrams per cc. And these are various concentrations of the Juvederm products up to, uh, this is supposed to be 24 milligrams, but they measured it at 23.3 milligrams per cc. So increasing amounts of HA content. They actually found that Juvederm, even with a lower HA content, was harder to dissolve than perlane and Restylane, which had a higher HA content. So these are all relative rates of degradation. So what you can see here is that Juvederm 24, which is what we commonly use in the US, was about 50% harder to dissolve relative to Restylane and Perlane. So now we're using Vitrace, and we studied a smooth gel of 24 milligrams per ml, which is Juvederm, versus Restylane, and then one that was 5.5 milligrams per ml, which is no longer available in the States, which was Prevail Silk or Hyloform. This was 2010. And they found that Juvederm was more resistant to degradation than all the others. And they suggested, like the other studies, that cross-linking, monophasic, high rate of concentration was more resistant to the hyaluronidase. So this was the most complicated study, and it kind of is contradictory to some other studies. Um, they used low doses of hyaluronidase and they studied the hyaluronic acid up to 20 hours. And they found that monophasic or biphasic didn't matter. There's actually controversy of whether monophasic really exists or all monophasic is actually biphasic. So that term is kind of falling out of favor now. 
They found that higher concentration of HA fillers were more resistant like we previously said. But the thing that they differed in regards to the other studies was that Belotero was easy to degrade. Unfortunately, Belotero is a very small player in this market, and so it's almost irrelevant where Belotero falls. They found that Emerville and Juvederm were consistent with the other studies. Emerville would be Restylane uh, refined. So here's the studies here, and Juvederm would be in the blue. And you showed that there was very little degradation of the Juvederm. But the Emerville, which is Restylane refined, and Belotero dropped off gradually over 20 hours. And this was with low dose um, hyaluronidase. So there was another paper in 2020, and they concluded that higher concentrations of XA and more cross-linking became more resistant. So we're seeing a theme here. More concentration, higher cross-links are more resistant. So in summary, more resistant to hyaluronidase, Juvederm over Voluma, less resistant to hyaluronidase, Restylane and Emerville. Variable resistance to hyaluronidase is Belotero, but most studies say that it's high resistance. So now we're going to go over the crux of this video, and I'm going to talk about my proposed dissolvability guide. And over at the far right here, it's the easiest filler to dissolve. These are the NASA fillers. These are Restylane, Lift, and Restylane Silk. And why are they easy? It's because they have a concentration of 20 milligrams per cc of hyaluronic acid, and they have very little cross-linking. Uh, they're said to be 1%, but if you actually boil down the numbers, it's, it could be as low as 0.2%. So almost pure HA. That's why they're very easy. So let's then go into the next column, which is the medium or easy medium fillers. And those are your Refine or the Emerville that was shown in another study, Kiss and Define. So those are 20 milligram per cc fillers as well, but they're cross-links between 6 and 8%. So they're going to be a little bit more difficult than your uh, NASA products, but not that much more difficult. Then, as we saw in the other studies, that Voluma was more difficult to dissolve than uh, Restylane. And so they're going to be, quote, medium hard. Now, these other two products, Valor and Volbella, they actually have a slightly less concentration of HA than the Voluma. So they're going to be uh, as easy or easier to dissolve than Voluma. And I put Versa here. I'm just guessing because there was no studies with Versa. I think it uh, falls in this category. It might actually fall in the hardest category because it does act a little bit like Juvederm. But I'm just throwing it in there right now. The studies all concluded that Juvederm and Juvederm Ultra Plus were very difficult to dissolve. And then Belotero, it was variable. Some, one study said it was easy. All the other studies said it was hard. But basically, it's irrelevant because it's a very, very small part of the market. So let me go on to um, my suggestions. In the areas that you are concerned about uh, dissolving the filler, like around the eye, we frequently do dissolve filler around the eye. What would you rather use? Something that's more difficult to dissolve or something that's more easy to dissolve? So that's why I like to use wrestling around the eye because it's easy to dissolve. Because I would say even in the best uh, case scenarios, you probably dissolve it around 10 to 15%. Another point is, is that in the areas that are at high risk for blindness or vascular occlusion, like the nose, glabella, forehead, like my other um, video suggested, maybe even temples, I would like to use an HA filler that's easy to dissolve, just in case in that emergency. So again, I prefer to use these in those cases. Now, do I inject in those areas? I don't usually do injections in those areas. I'm just making a suggestion to you that if you're injecting in the nose, glabella, forehead, or even the temples, that you might want to use these fillers. I know there's some experts out there and they're using all types of fillers, but I'm just suggesting for the majority of uh, injectors, stay with these fillers because they're easy. So one more point. All these suggestions and recommendations and dissolvability are based on normal HA. Now, if the patient is having delayed onset nodule, if they're having granulomas, all bets are off. It's going to be a lot harder to dissolve. I know that some of these fillers have a lot of delayed onset nodules and they're going to be very difficult to treat. So in conclusion, higher HA concentration, more resistant. Higher cross-linking, more resistant. More cohesivity, 
uh, is more resistant. Cohesivity means the ability to bond to itself. Possibly monophasic is more resistant than biphasic, but that's controversial. But here's something that wasn't studied and I found in my clinical experience. The longer the filler has been in place, the harder it is to dissolve. And I can't exactly tell you why, but that's my clinical experience.